Hi, everybody. Welcome to Aging Well. I'm Patricia Greenberg, and I'm thrilled to have with me today someone who's recognizable the world over, Butch Patrick. He played the lovable Eddie Munster on the iconic series, The Munsters, which ran from 1964 to 1966. And did you know that he was a regularly working actor all through the 60s and 70s and beyond? Let's begin. Welcome, Butch. Thank you so much. You know, I want to start out by saying we all loved watching the Munsters. And to this day, the Munster family is still looked at as a solid suburban family with quirks. <laughs> you know, that's that's kind of one of the unusual factors that nobody read into it was that uh -huh. we were a very believable family unit, which I think had a, a very big um, a very big input in how how well it's received today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's still um, it's it, it still uh, speaks to me. And there's uh, that little clip of Herman Munster talking to Eddie as they're going for a walk, giving him advice. And it's just so touching, brings tears to my eyes. Uh, and all the, you know, all the kitsch that went on in the back scene, you still had that sense that they were a family and loved each other so much. Um, how old were you when the show ran? 11 and 12. Oh. Yeah, they had me playing eight or nine. I was small for my age, but that even worked better because Fred being seven foot tall, and me being so short, it uh, really made for the father and son dynamic to That's, even yeah. come out more. You know, your mother and grandfather were vampires. Your father was a man-made monster. And you were a werewolf with a pet dragon. Yes. Then you had a teenage cousin that looked like a classic Southern California ingenue. Yes. Was that lost on you at the time? No, no, <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, what they did is, is they, were, they were very smart guys. The people that produced the show had done Leave it to Beaver with great success. And um, one of the things about the Beaver show that maybe people weren't aware of, if, uh, aside from being highly successful, it was really the first sitcom that was written from a children's point of view, from the children looking at life and their, fa and their fa parents being sort of the supporting actors mm -hmm. to where it was about the kids. And they took that concept and applied it to the Munsters, but added in the Universal Monsters, which Universal Studios was famous for, and all the looks and the lighting and the sets and all the monster stuff was integrated quality-wise into this show with Leave it to Beaver overtones and scripts. And, you know, on paper, it looked like mm, maybe not, but the they hit, you know, they, they hit gold. It was magic because the family unit came into play and it was so believable that you immediately, you never thought of Herman Munster as, as Frankenstein. He was right. Herman Munster. Right. And so on. And grandpa, he was grandpa. He wasn't Dracula. And it, you know, and it just worked. Ooh. It's brilliant. It was a brilliant convergence of all the things going on at the time in the 60s that were, um, you, you know, it, it's fun. That's a funny age, 11 and 12. You know, that's, you're not quite a man. You're not a little kid anymore. And- <laughs> Uh, you know, so you're you're reaching puberty and having your your awakening in life with this very kitschy, uh, you know, funny but lovable situation going on. But did you go to school while this was going on or were you, or were you totally schooled on set? I was. Uh, well, um, for the two years that you're doing a series, you're when you're in production, you're on the set mm -hmm. uh, when you're not in production. Um, obviously you go back to public school. I, I don't think that I went back to public school for the two years because I think when we had the break. Uh, it was either at Christmas or it was sometime where I didn't really go back into school. But for two years, I was, uh, as, as all child actors are, three hours a day on the set okay. with a welfare worker that's there to teach you. And uh, and I actually think I probably got a better education because if you're um, smart and you're, and, you're, and you're absorbing what you're being taught, three hours of one-on-one -on -one can be very, very much um, probably more of a have more impact on your actual grades than uh, being in a school for eight hours with uh, 30 people in a class. Absolutely. Absolutely. How did you, how did you fare socially in those days with other kids around neighborhood or. <laughs> was, yeah, you know, kids are kids. It was pretty brutal for a while, yeah. but um, it, it gave me thick skin and, uh, and it allowed me to let um, turn the other cheek. Don't let things bother you. Uh, you know, sticks and stones, all of the cliches. But what really helped me out when I went back to school was I uh, befriended a couple of ninth graders, took pity upon me and took me under their wing. And the, and the fact that the kids found out that I wasn't really being affected, that their that their little you know smart remarks weren't getting them anywhere, it wore off within a few weeks. OK, good, 
good. Now, I know the Munsters only ran for two years, but you've been synonymous with Eddie Munster for 60 years now. Tell us about what other shows you were on and what, what are some of your favorites? The Real McCoys, General Hospital, My Three Sons, The Monkees. I actually watched your clip about The Monkees. That was so touching when you were on The Monkees. That must have been for you just something that goes down in history is an amazing experience, yeah? Yeah, people ask me what was like my favorite thing to do. And there's a couple of them, but the monkeys is at, is at the top of the list. And I, and I got to tell you why. Um, number one, I was 13, 14 years old and the monkeys were huge. I mean, they were yeah. a hit. They were a hit show. Everybody. I mean, the, they, the Beatles weren't performing anymore. I, 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 they had just finished. So um, I miss meeting the Beatles when they came to Hollywood, you know, and the doing the monkeys was something that I really wanted to do. Normally, when I went on an interview, I would go in, I would give it my best shot, and I would go home, and I would, and I really could care less what what the results were. I, you know, I, you do your best, and you go home. This particular one, I got home and I called Mary Grady, my agent, and I said, "What? Any word yet? Any word yet? Any word yet?" Because <laughs> I really wanted it. And when I got the part, it was like I went to school and told everybody, which I never did, because I knew this would be something nobody was going to make fun of. This was like, okay, you know, yeah. I lie, big yeah. feather in my cap. But doing the show. Number one, um, it was a written a script was written about me. It was it was basically I was an equal to the monkeys. It was me and them in almost every scene. It was a Christmas show, which showed it had some meaning and moral value, and there was a message there. And the, and the fact that um, with the end of the I think in my interview I t I said I was so excited to see the final cut because not only did they sing Ryu Chu wonderfully a cappella and show their talent, but they also then. Show, broke down the fourth wall and introduced the world to what it was like to be on the set of the monkeys by bringing everybody out and and, and and that's exactly what it was they were fun they were energetic they were they were super professional but they super had they were they, they were a representative of what the 60s were like did you keep in touch with them throughout the years after being on the show well, not in a personal way, but uh, later on, as I got older, yes, uh, I joined a car club and uh, we had Peter because the monkey mobile yeah. would be anonymous with a lot of the car shows I was doing. So I would see Peter and Mickey, uh, Mike occasionally, Davey once or twice. I ran into Davey, not so much at car shows with Davey, mostly at concerts and music venues with him. But yeah, over the years, we uh, they remembered me and they remember the episode. And uh, now it's just me and Mickey. Yeah. Yeah. How is Mickey doing? He's doing great. Great, doing great. great. He's, so he's, happy to hear he that. is probably, in my opinion, the more I see him and the more I know him, he really is one of the most underrated, in my opinion, um, talents in the world. You know, he's just amazing. You know, I wanted to ask you a couple of things that it's sort of, sort of a then and now. But you're one of the most famous people on the planet. You no, but the character, the character. The character, but you're synonymous <laughs> with the character. So, you know... Then and now, you know, are you still recognize like if you go out and get a cup of coffee somewhere or people go, wow, you, that's Eddie Munster? I'm I'm recognized just enough to keep me on my toes, but not mm -hmm. enough for it to be an issue. OK, but, but it is interesting that my, my favorite thing was um, when someone would be out or you would be out and someone would say, uh, oh, what do you do? And you would say, hey, you know, I used to act and they'd look at you like, oh, you know, I don't recognize you. So you must not be much of an actor because I don't recognize you. And then they're trying to make fun of you. I mean, they're, they're going to use you as a, you know, they're, you're going to be a target for their arrow. And then you say, but I was on a show called the Munsters and they immediately, they go, you were Eddie Munster. I love that show. Oh my God. And you become immediately their best buddy. So it could work really, really well. But I always found it funny that you could never spend enough money in the world to brand the Munsters and the Eddie Munsters and the characters because they, they've been around so long and they're so identifiable that it's it's an it's an interesting dynamic so when you use it it can be very valuable but uh yeah like i say butch Patrick, nobody knows but if i have an eddie buster shirt on out people come and say i love that guy and yeah. I, say, I go well you're looking at him <laughs> <laughs> so has there been a remake of the monsters at all or an attempted uh uh, uh any um redos yeah there's been, actually there have been several there was one in the 80s a tv series that lloyd schwartz son of Sherwood Schwartz, who did oh. Gilligan's Island and the Brady Bunch. Mm -hmm. That was done for three years. And I'm friends with basically, well, John Chuck passed away, but I'm, fr I'm friends with J Jason, uh, Jason Marsden, who was Eddie. Then we did a movie. They did a movie, uh, The Munster's Revenge, which I was not a part of in 82. 
Then they did another movie in the early 90s with Edward Herman. We did a cameo, the whole re existing cast, with Yvonne DiCarlo, Al Lewis, Pat Priest, and myself. And then Rob Zombie, two years ago, did a his remake. So there's been, and then they also did a scary little Christmas in Australia with Sam McMurray and Veronica Hamill from Kill Street Blues. Sure. So it's been, it's been redone four times. And one series and four movies. None of them took off anywhere near the the way that the Munsters did originally, though. No, they really haven't. And uh, Rob Zombies was kind of a different take on it. He uh, made it pre-Eddie, pre-Marilyn. It was called the, the greatest love story ever told because it told how Lily and Herman got together and met, which was kind oh, of fun. Interesting. And they did, it, they did it in Hungary and he left it wide open for a sequel. Whether he does it or not mm -hmm. remains to be mm -hmm. seen. But it was a nice spin on it because it showed how they met, which was important. You know, my husband's Transylvanian. He is 100% Transylvanian. And when his parents came here, the, um, the all the kids would make fun of his parents' accent and say, you know, say you sound like Dracula. Yeah. So it's just kind of in it, all the eerie stuff that comes with Transylvania. We actually have family from there. So it's kind of fun. You know, I'm sure your listeners uh, here, uh, your fans and listeners would love to know, were you close with your castmates at the time of filming the show? And did you stay in touch after the show ended, were, were Lily and Herman in real life like parents to you? Did you did you bond with them? There was an interesting dynamic to that whole thing. Um, right before the Munsters, I just finished The Real McCoys, and my mom had married a baseball player for the California Angels, back then the Los Angeles Angels, and he got traded to the Washington Senators. And when the whole family moved to Washington, D.C., I chose to go with my grandmother back to Illinois to this little town where I enrolled in the fifth grade in a parochial school nonetheless it was funny because uh, kenny was a roman catholic and we were trying to appease the catholic church and my mom had been a divorcee so there was issues with yeah, the church. Going on. Mm -hmm. we we're all trying to appease them so i i enrolled in uh, saint malachy's i wasn't taught by a nun but taught by the normal teacher and it was it was a fun time so what happened was i got a call from my agent they said they want to see you for this series out in california called the munsters and get on a plane Grandma drove me to Chicago, I guess. And I got on a plane and my uncle picked me up at the airport and I went off and I did the screen test with Yvonne DiCarlo. Now the series had already been green lighted by the networks, but they weren't happy with mom and, and Eddie. They wanted to recast those two parts. So they brought in Yvonne DiCarlo, major movie star, big name, and me. And we tested together and they said, make arrangements to report to work. So now I've got an empty house where we were living and my mom and dad and everybody's gone. So I moved in with my uncle Woody. And we hired a woman to take me to work every day. And the long story to get around to this was I was spending more time with my TV family yeah. than I was with the real family. So, yes, they definitely were my family for two years. And um, how about the Marilyn character? I had a huge crush on Beverly Owen. I love Pat. I'm very yep. good friends with Pat. But when I was a kid, Beverly Owen, I was Miss Uliano, my fifth grade teacher, and Beverly Owen were my two big crushes in life. Yeah. And Beverly was such a doll. She was just so sweet and so nice that she actually did did me one of my, the biggest service of my life. She came down and she knew that I had wanted to go see Mary Poppins. It was a premiere coming up and she came down in a little Volkswagen, 20 miles on a weekend, picked me up, drove me all the way back to Hollywood, took me in to see Mary Poppins with her. And uh, to this day, I, even, I told Dick Van Dyke when I met him, I go, you know, you were like basically on the screen at my first date with Marilyn Munster. He goes, what? <laughs> I told him, he laughed. He yeah. thought that was so cool that Eddie Munster's yeah. first date was with Marilyn Munster and we went and saw Mary Poppins. Yeah, that's <laughs> so cute. So they, they answer your question. Yeah, they, they're yeah. both Marilyn, very, very dear. And Pat is still with us. And mm. I will be seeing her in a few weeks at a, a big convention called Chiller Theater in, uh, in Parsippany, New Jersey, the end of this month. Okay, great. So you're still out on the circuit. That's fabulous. Yep. You know, but but we're having a re a big resurgence of interest in nostalgia from, as you know, from the '60s and '70s, because those of us on the tail end of the baby boom are now in our '60s, and we want that comfort of our childhood, and yep. the innocence and the fun and the wonder that came with it. Um, how do you feel about the progression from wholesome, funny? kitschy, you know, 60s and 70s TV shows to now where we have substantial violence, graphic, disturbing images everywhere we look. You know, it's funny. I went to a movie the other night and I was watching the previews. There's a movie coming out called Civil War. And I, I, I immediately said, you know, uh, what a bad idea. Just what a, you know, this is such a sellout for Hollywood to make a movie about such a horrible time in America's history, to make a movie that is just straight up, you know, riding the wave of all the, the horrible things that's going on. It's just mm -hmm. all about dollars. All It's just horrible. And I wish 
Hollywood would would monitor itself better, but you know, it's without getting into it, it's a very much different world than it used to be. And what's funny about it is one of my really, really cool things that fell into my lap the other day was I've always enjoyed driving movies. I grew up with driving movies and families going in their jammies and the station wagon and the kids going up the swings before the movie. It gets dark. The movie starts. I mean, just a great time to be a kid in the 60s. I grew yeah. up in the 50s. I came of age in the 60s and I went on through the 70s. But um, what I'm doing is I've contacted the Drive-In Owners Association of America. There's 146 drive-ins left in the country. And we're uh, going to do a few this year to tweak it. But next year, I'm going to do an entire tour of the Midwest. all, And then Route 66 turns 100. So I'm oh, wow. Wow. Route 66 is 100. Drive-in movies. I'm going to spend the whole next two years during the 60th anniversary of the Munsters going into towns that have a drive-in. And then I'm going to work the drive-in movie evening and with a place to go after they have their annual festival. Every little city's got something going on in the summertime for the town. We're going to coordinate whatever the town's doing. They're the key to the city. We're going to get the car clubs to come out to the drive-in movie. And we're going to have a really good time and show Munster Go Home in an episode of the Munsters, maybe the one with Eddie's nickname where we have that wonderful talk yeah, uh, yeah. about the strength of your character you know, and, and the size of your heart. So I'm really looking forward to creating. I love the idea of creating something that's never been done. And this is right up my alley. It's nostalgia. It's fun. It's family. It's pricing back like the 60s, affordable stuff. Yes, yeah. And if it works, then I can then be the go-to guy for the theaters to bring in a star and a car from Christine or from Back to the Future. Or or there's a lot of very various ways to do this drive-in movie concept and this um, this framework. So Hopefully um, this will keep me busy for the next few years and lead me into my retirement. Yeah. Yeah. It's wonderful. You have so much energy and enthusiasm to keep this going. It's amazing. Um, now I, again, what was going on behind the scenes then in TV land on all the shows you were at that we, we talk about how children were treated on the set. You know, it's funny. Bill Moody, there's a lot of there's a lot of stories about that, but I'm curious how you fared in those okay. days. I'm the, and Bill Moody and I have spoken at personally to each other about it, and yeah. I, so we were very lucky apparently because it was never a problem, and never never had an issue. I I had one issue, but I was well into my late teens, and I was actually a man, and at that point in time, it was very easy for me to punch somebody in the nose, and it never uh -huh. went anywhere. So that wasn't a problem. But as a kid, it, I never had an issue with it. And, I, and thank God I didn't. But Paul Peterson, who, you, if you know the name of Paul Peterson from the Donna Reed show, he formed a minor consideration for his friend, Rusty Hamer, who killed himself from Make Room for Daddy because of all of the stuff that had been going on in the Hollywood, the Judy Garland and the Mickey Rooney and uh, yes. the Hollywood yeah. scene yeah. was very, very bad. And, and kids got really uh, hammered by it. And that was just financially and, and the workload, not to mention the other sexual overtone situations that came into sure. play with Corey Feldman and Corey Haim and a lot of other situations. Never had it, never happened to me. And Paul Peterson uh, is a dear friend. And we've, uh, I'm, I'm, in, I'm a part of his minor consideration, as was Elizabeth Taylor, as was with Roddy McDowell. And he came and formed this group to help combat that problem. Okay. I think it got worse over the years. I think that, my daughter did a little bit of acting. She had an onset teacher. She had a child advocate. She had a cook and account. You know, we were very, very on top of that. And um, I just remember that they didn't want the parents on the set. This is as recently as my daughter's oh. only 23. They want the there parents out. And I, I wasn't, I stayed, I wasn't going to put up with that, but. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of things. I uh, was a spokesperson for a friend of mine who uh, was a casting director and a talent agent in Cleveland. And she was working for John Powers or somebody. And she was very disillusioned of how they were taking these people's money and, and not delivering the goods. So right. she blew, she became a whistleblower to the news and ran them out of Cleveland. And to replace them, she created her own company. And it was called How to Get in the Show Business the Right Way. And she needed someone to go on the radio and talk about it. And Paul Peterson started it, but couldn't maintain it. And then he recommended me. So when we would do the screen tests, I would explain to the parent, a lot of times it was, a, most of it was children with their parents. That was right. most of it. There right. was a case that it was an adult, but it was mostly kids and parents. And what I would explain to them was, it was nothing harder than seeing a kid with no talent and kind of being pushed by his parents because, you know, they're going to, and there's, there is, it's never going to happen. And you're going to do great damage to this kid's, you know, you know, self-esteem and this and that. But 
the reasoning where I'm going with this is I would explain to them how you may want to maybe think about behind the scenes because the odds are against anybody getting into acting. But if you want to be in the industry, there are better ways with better um, possibilities and averages of success. All those people at the end of the movie, you know, they all get bench, they all have pensions, they all get benefits, they all are on the lot. And if you want to be an actor, you're going to stand a lot better chance of getting in front of the camera if you're at least in the game, right? Somewhere. You know, that was one. Number two is I told them, and then there's another thing people don't take into consideration is to answer your question in a long round way. That's okay. Money came, in, money came into play and money does strange things to people. So when there's big money at stake, back when I was working, my stepdad was a ball player. We made 30 grand a year. You know, I mean, we had jobs and he had a job in the off season. No, no millions of dollars. I right. wasn't making dollars. We were just working stiffs, making a living. But today with the money so astronomically out of whack to the average guy, it clouds a lot of people's eyes. But the one thing that I explained to them is you don't understand. You think some Johnny gets in the movies, you're going to have, there are issues with the family back home. One of the, one of the parents has to take off. The other parents still working. The kids at home feel neglected. You are opening up a Pandora's box of issues yes. Yes. that can affect your family unit. Is it worth it? You know, uh, that remains to be seen, but a lot of people don't even think about it until it's too late. So, Butch, tell us about what you're working on now. What is, uh, you have a, a website, www.themonsters.com. Not the, just, just Munsters. Oh, Munsters.com. Yeah. Okay, let's .com. I've had that for about 30 years. Um, most of the thing, I have a Munster coach. I have a Dragula. I have, I'm a hot rod guy. I've got toys and cars. Um, so what I do is I live in Arkansas now and I enjoy car related events, which is why this drive-in movie thing and Route 66 yeah. is right my wheelhouse but over the years i have been hired as a prop to be come into a convention come into a business come into a grand marshal at a parade so having kept my eyes open and, and seeing that now what i do is i contact people and work with them as a partner to make a better event status for them Okay. And one of the neat things about being on the Munsters, it's a very evergreen, family-friendly, multi-generational purpose. And people all respond fondly. Most people, not everybody, but you know, the vast majority respond in kind, nicely to uh, being with the Munsters and then talking to them to show them how they can sort of make their event even better at no cost to themselves. I, I sort of show them the ropes of how they can uh, bring in celebrities and make their event better without actually having to uh, get in their own pocket. Oh, that's great. That's wonderful. So it, it yeah. helps everybody. And right. I think, you know, that that there's this whole horrible to me, it's it's, you know, I'm in, I'm in my 60s. And every time I hear this, that someone's not relevant or a has been or any of this terminology, I, yeah. I, I throw it out the window. You're relevant from the day you're born till the day you die. Everybody has something to offer. Right. I. So do you find at the comp? Do you go to Comic-Con? Is that another one that you make? I do, I, I, that? I, yeah. I, and, um, you know, it, it's it's who comes up to you most? Is it is it our age group, people in their 60s and 70s? Or are you finding even older people? Is your fan base still exactly right around our age here? The, you know, the tail end of the baby boomers, kids born in the 50s and 60s. Um, the, the fan base is kind of like my age and older. But uh -huh. if they have introduced their kids and their grandkids to it, that's the fan base as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a matter of have I, I have no shortage of, of little, not little kids, but young girls and boys coming up that have made me something. And they, they've, they've given me a gift. Very, a lot of fan base across the board. Um, yes, most more so um, in the older realm, like my age, what they'll do is they'll mention like, oh my God, you know, I grew up with you and you know, you were my go-to show when I came home from school. And then the fun part is they'll say, did you ever do anything else? And then I have a pre-printed out sheet yeah. of 75 credits and four series and mm -hmm. 17 movies and 60 commercials that I said, yes, as a matter of fact, and then they go down, they go, oh my God, you rawhide with Clint Eastwood? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, too. A Gunsmokes, too. Mr. Ed's, too. So it's fun for them to not, they're looking at the monsters, but at the same time, they're seeing like a TV guide who's who of the shows from 1960 to 1971. Right. And if you had to be in a decade for music and movies and television, started in the black and white, transitioned to color and went on to better things. It was a wonderful um, a decade to be part of it in, uh, in a very, you know, in the wonder years, so to speak. Yes. Were the monsters ever in color or was black and white the whole time? I remember black, black and white. white. Yeah, never, never went to color. 
Uh, what year did color become the thing in the 60s? It transitioned from 65 to 66. Okay. Okay. So what we did is the, at the third season was coming around, there was talk about going to color. The network didn't want to pay for it. The producers didn't want to pay for it. Fred and Al were from New York. I think, honestly, I think they were ready to go home. Yeah. Uh, I, th I think the shows were getting a little thin. The scripts were, you know, they'd pretty much gone to the well and uh, they decided to do the Munster Go Home movie, which was in color as a strategic business move because nobody else outside the country knew who the Munsters were because it takes a few years for reruns to hit Europe hit Australia and South America, but by showing a feature film worldwide, now all the countries and all the markets knew who the Munsters were and that helped them sell the syndication rights because syndication was just in its infancy. Yeah. Just starting yeah. In the late so at the time, were you expected as Eddie Munster to go out and present yourself as Eddie Munster? Did you have to wear the garb and the makeup and go do uh, appearances at the time the show was happening or that wasn't a thing only in those once, days only once i did that. i went to a phoenix mall opening back when the, there were no malls it was like one of the first malls in america yeah. they, they they had a guy named bob birds in a gorilla suit who they thought eddie should have a pet kogar so he's in his gorilla suit i put my own makeup on on the airplane in the hour flight from la yeah. to to phoenix Five thousand kids showed up i have a picture of me with a security and a guy with a microphone yeah. and, and bob in his monkey suit next to me and i'm like yeah. i'm just Dumb like, family, right? it was like what the <laughs> heck just happened you know but that was the only time that happened uh you know kids back in the day in the 60s you didn't do the tonight show you didn't do talk shows maybe right. a mike douglas i did art link letter you know uh, uh there was a couple there was a show in in phoenix that was Laz laszlo and somebody that was a really famous uh cutting edge show at the time i mean they had like paul mccartney on it and stuff i mean a lot oh, wow. of great mm -hmm. mm -hmm. a lot of solid people did this la i can't remember the life of me what it's called but it was a very hip edgy show it's like the first movie i ever did with um with uh it's called the two little bears when i had never worked before in my life they just kind of called me up because they saw my picture in a in a studio photography window and i worked with soupy sales you talk about comedy you know sure. old. eddie albert jane white were my parents brenda lee ah. fifth with my older sister, my singing sensation, uh, Brenda Lee, and Nancy Culp, Miss Hathaway, you know, from the Beverly Hillbillies, played my school teacher. So it was like a great little six weeks of experience to get the ball rolling, so to speak. And then after that, I did General Hospital and the McCoys, and one thing led to another, and off you go. I didn't know General Hospital was on that long. Yeah, yeah, I did the first ever episode. The first. Oh my ever, goodness! First, first wow. Three episodes ever. Uh, I was on. I believe it was 1962 or three. But okay. it was the first episode of yeah, that's kind of cool too. That so is throughout the years, I've done a couple of interesting one offs. Like I did Chuck Jones's only feature film called The Phantom Toll Booth, which was really cool. The same summer I did The Monkeys. Uh, I did um, Sid and Marty Croft's Lidsville series, uh, 19 summer of 71 out of Paramount, which was kind of an interesting, you know, summer of 71 with the uh, Charles Nelson Riley and Billy Hayes, The Monkeys episode, The Simpsons. Um, and in between a lot of regular stuff, but I was, I had, I did nine episodes of my three sons uh, as Ernie's best friend through various stages of life. So with different names, you know, they brought me back as a whole, to totally yeah, different character. Yeah. Yeah. They changed the name, brought me back. Yeah. That's very funny. That's so interesting. Yeah. You know, uh, I, you know, for those of you who want to reach out to Butch Patrick and see what he's going on now, go to munsters.com. Butch, thank you so much for joining us. And in closing, of course, I want to ask, what do you like about getting older? Oh, you know, I, I don't, I don't mind getting older at all. It's first of all, you, you can't really do anything about it. It's, it's like, it's kind of like when people say, what would you have done differently? I go, seriously, why would you, I mean, you know, everybody's got that question, but the point is, it's almost like, a, unless I can help other people avoid the problem, you know, um, the one thing I like about getting older is basically I partied all my life. I've been sober over 13 years now. Okay. Congratulations. So I, mm -hmm. I enjoy the clarity. I enjoy the history. I enjoy the amount of joy that a little show that i did a long long time ago has brought people whether or not it's a has-been situation to some people i don't care it doesn't bother me at all i'm, I'm, I'm yeah. going to be a has-been that i've never been but i don't consider myself that and i enjoy that it has allowed me to um travel meet people and i enjoy the fact that now when i used to be the drunk driver the dd i am now the designated driver with but, the DD. Good, and good. that's that's probably the biggest thing and the biggest change and the biggest accomplishment is the fact that I've uh, turned it around and now I can help other people achieve um, sobriety too. 
I'm so uh, in, in, inspired by what you're doing now and that you're here and you're so enthusiastic and energetic. Butch Patrick, again, thank you so much for joining us here. And thank all of you who are listening. I'm Patricia Greenberg. And please subscribe to the channel on YouTube for more information on Aging Well. And I wish you all a wonderful day. Bye-bye.